I'm Kristen Lodge, the Director of Development and Communications at the Wenatchee Valley Museum and Cultural Center. Thank you for being here today for this COVID vaccine Q&A session with the Chelan Douglas Health District and with Confluence Health. The Wenatchee Valley Museum is located on the traditional homelands of the Pascosa Wenatchee. We acknowledge the traditional lands and offer respect and gratitude to the Pascosa and to the diverse indigenous peoples that reside in North Central Washington today. Our mission at the museum is to engage and educate in the Wenatchee Valley community. Our museum also serves as a community forum, a place where you can meet with your neighbors, learn about issues important to our community and discuss your thoughts and opinions. While we're not able to gather together at the museum right now, we're enjoying the opportunity to gather virtually in forums like this until we can be back together in person. Our goal today is to provide our community with the opportunity to discuss public health and to get your questions answered about the COVID-19 vaccine, availability, locations, safety, and efficacy. Today, we have Spanish translation provided by Sylvia with Claris Languages. Thank you, Sylvia. If you're logged into Zoom, you have the option of listening to the translated audio channel. You can do this by clicking on the icon of the globe and selecting the Spanish option. Leading today's conversation is Dr. Malcolm Butler, Health Officer with the Chelan Douglas Health District and Joellen Colson, Senior Vice President and Vaccine Coordinator at Confluence Health. Welcome. I will be on hand to moderate today's session. We encourage you to join in. If you're joining us via Zoom or Facebook Live, um, feel, feel free to leave a question in comments or in chat or Q&A, and I'll monitor those channels and do my best to make sure they get answered. I'd like to give Do Dr. Butler and Joellen the opportunity to share some information with you first, and then we'll open it up to your questions. Dr. Butler, let's begin with you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us again. Um, yeah, I would say overall right now, uh, we are doing very well locally. Uh, the incidence rates are down around 125 per 100,000 per 14 days. The bad news is we're just beginning to see an uptick. I think uh, Joellen at Confluence Health has seen an uptick in the last couple of days in the uh, number of positive tests that are coming back. Um, and so I am concerned that we're starting up into the fourth wave. Um, we are seeing an increased number of cases in children, um, and we know that the B117 variant has a preponderance for children. So even though we have no evidence right now that the new variant is in town, I am suspicious. And so I'm just going to encourage everybody to double down on the, on the PPE and the social distancing and the masking and the hand washing, because we've come so far um, that we don't want to lose any ground. And it's a race right now between uh, getting vaccines into people's arms and uh, these new variants descending on our valley. Thank you for that information. Joellen? Yeah, definitely agree with Dr. Butler. We're seeing increasing numbers of uh, positive COVID tests here at Confluence Health. Um, very excited that uh, we're here today on a day that more people are eligible for the vaccine. So um, in order to beat the virus, we need to get as many shots in arms as we can. Um, and so uh, again, encouraging people, if, if you're eligible, please, uh, please get in line, uh, sign up. We are seeing decreasing challenges with supply chain. And so um, more vaccine is flowing into Washington state and we're, we're excited to be able to facilitate people getting shots at the location that works for them. Good. Joellen and Dr. Butler, I'd love for you to expand on that. The biggest question on all of our minds is, can you tell us who within our community is currently eligible for the vaccine, how they get signed up, and where they should go? And I understand we opened phase 1B tier 2 today. Yes. Good. What does that mean? I'll, I have my handy dandy cheat sheet so that um, I can get this right, but anyone can go on to um, covidvaccinewa.org and pull down a very nice infographic that explains the current phases and who's eligible. And so eligible today are high risk critical workers in certain congregate settings like agriculture, fishing vessel crews, food processing, grocery stores, corrections, prisons, jails, detention centers, our public transit, 
um, any remaining first responders, and then a whole other group, and it's called people 16 years or older who are pregnant or those individuals who have a disability that puts them at high risk for COVID. And so um, th there's a lot of um, detail to these groups. Uh, for instance, I was reading uh, those working at food banks are eligible for vaccine. And so I really encourage people if they have any questions to go on to phase finder and move through the questions um, and see if they're eligible and hopefully they are. Great, I'm feeling really positive about this opportunity to open this additional tier. We've mm -hmm. been hearing a lot about an overage of appointments we're experiencing at Town Toyota Center, but with, with such limited ability for, for people to access those. So that's really good news. And it sounds like just before you joined us, you had a meeting with the governor at Town Toyota. Was that, was that topic discussed while you were together? Yeah. Um... You know, I think the uh, it's difficult because on the other side of the state, things are completely different than they are here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it is very difficult still for people to find vaccines over there. And so it's difficult for us to advertise the fact that we have excess vaccine. Um, and it's difficult for the state to sort of wave a flag saying, go ahead and, and move forward. But what we have heard from the Department of Health is that <clears throat> if we have excess vaccine, they want us to get that into people's arms. And as long as we do it in a thoughtful and pragmatic way with sensitivity to equity issues, then they will support us in that. So the, the, you know, the official word is we start today. <clears throat> but I think we're, we have felt more flexibility than we felt in the past. Uh, to make sure that we're not allowing vaccine just to sit in refrigeration, refrigerators waiting for the uh, entire state to move forward to the next phase. And I have to admit that when I heard there were vaccine overages, I was picturing vaccines going to waste. But these vaccines are not being opened and not going to waste until these appointments are being... Uh, let me tell you a story. <clears throat> I was, uh, we were at Town Toyota Center today. Um, and one of the workers uh, I had known um, previously, and uh, she came up and we were chatting and she told me a story that last night they had one vaccine left over at the end of the day. And she walked next door to the Lowe's parking lot and walked car to car until she found someone who would accept the vaccine. So they're going to all kinds of lengths to make sure that no vaccines are wasted. I'm so glad to hear that. You talked a little bit about vaccine inequities. Can we talk about how our community is mitigating inequities as it relates to access to the vac vaccine, such as social or economic, environmental, uh, structural inequities? Yeah, so I'm gonna, Joellen told me um, a story uh, this afternoon about um, some Saturday clinics they've been running. So why don't you explain what you guys are doing, Joellen, to solve some of those equity pieces? Yeah, I think I mentioned last time that we're saying all doors are the right door. And so we're working uh, very closely as a community to ensure that we each have different niches. Um, and so at Confluence, one of our niches is having a weekend clinic. Our Saturday clinics um, have been very um, packed. <laughs> um, and, and part of that is because people don't want to miss work or they're unable to miss work. They also appreciate a Saturday um, opportunity in case they do have some um, symptoms after the vaccine and they need to uh, rest on Sunday. So we are working with um, a local uh, group called Parque Padrinos to do outreach to the Latinx community. And part of this work was funded through the Confluence Health Foundation. So we're really appreciative of, um, of their generosity in helping our Latinx population um, ensure that they um, have barriers that are removed so that they have access to the vaccines. We're also making sure that we have clinics in OMAC and Moses Lake uh, that meet the needs of those populations as well. Well, I applaud those efforts. Thank you for your work that you're doing there. Dr. Yeah. Butler, can you expand on that? Um, when the governor left the Town Toyota Center, he was driving up to Chelan to see the mm -hmm. first um, mass vaccination event at an agricultural facility. 
So the um, Lake Chelan Hospital Emergency um, Medical Services team has the capacity to go out to different sites. And so they're out at an ag site today and the governor is gonna be up there visiting with them. Um, those sort of activities are ongoing. <clears throat> um, at Columbia Valley Community Health, certainly we have full bilingual capacity and we are reaching out to all of our patients to invite them into our sites once they're available. Um, and the uh, Chelan Douglas Health District is working with um, Columbia Valley Community Health and with Confluence and with um, uh, Cascade and Lake Chelan Community Hospital. And we are parsing out all the different agricultural facilities and um, how we're gonna get the shots out to those essential workers. <clears throat> You're probably aware that the educators have already been coming in in different ways. I know that the local pharmacies are also helping uh, in that. Um, so yeah, we're anything we can think of. Now, obviously it's much more efficient to have people drive in to a centralized site. Um, I heard today that the fastest they have yet been delivering vaccines was one every 15 seconds, one five seconds. Now they've got four lines of cars and so it's probably actually one a minute between four lanes, but um, it's impressively efficient at the Town Toyota Center. So certainly anybody who can get there should get there. Uh, but for folks who can't navigate the um, registration system on the internet or don't have the transportation, we will get to you. Um, it just takes us longer because it's it takes more people and more energy to get out uh, into the periphery and help people who have who have those challenges. But but we are going to get there for sure. Yeah, and I do want to mention there it, there are phone lines through the health district for individuals who have technology barriers or other barriers, and then those um, those schedulers can do the the uh, data entry into PrepMod and make those appointments. Also really want to call out um, Link Transit. Uh, received a heads up that Link Transit is allowing people to um, show up at Columbia Station, receive a ride to the Town Toyota Center on certain times, and then literally the bus is going through that vaccination site and vaccinating everyone on it. So wow. those are the sorts of barriers that are being removed by um, a community that is eager to see this pandemic end. That makes me very proud of our community right. and, yep. and of both of you for all of those efforts to collaborate with those great community partners. Thank you. Um, we have a question in chat asking about the ETA of when the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be available here. What would you say to people um, who have a preference on vaccine? Which one should they get? Yeah, no, that's interesting. We already have the Johnson vaccine uh, in town. Um, so, it, it's an interesting question and a little bit, I guess, to my surprise, I'm learning that there are a lot of people who are very interested in receiving the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, I think largely because it's only one dose <laughs> and they don't have to fuss with two doses. What I would say is you should receive whatever vaccine is available when you have a chance to get it. They are all equivalent in any important way um, there are some populations that the health district is going to focus the Johnson & Johnson vaccine on, and those are populations where we're just not sure that they can come back for the second shot. So it's um, homeless people, it is migrant workers, uh, it is perhaps people who are incarcerated and might be moved off the site. So there are some populations where it really makes sense to use that Johnson & Johnson. Um, but other, other than that, it's whatever we get the most of, that's what we're going to be given. And um, if you have a, uh, you know, in, in a month, uh, we'll probably have more than enough vaccine and people may be able to request, you know, different vaccines. We're not there yet. I hope that we will get there. Um, the Johnson & Johnson is going to be much easier for everybody. And it's the type of thing that we can load in the back of a truck and drive out um, to the smaller communities and vaccinate. Also, it's the kind of thing that I'll have in my primary care clinic uh, so that if somebody comes in and they're seeing me for a sprained ankle, I can ask them, hey, have you had your COVID shot yet? And can I give one to you? But uh, we can't do that with the other um, vaccines right now because of all the logistical problems of keeping them in the deep freeze and opening you know, 10 shots at a time sort of thing. Thank you. 
Let's talk a little bit in general about the vaccine safety. And then I wanna ask some follow-up questions about vaccine recommendations for specific groups like pregnant women. But for those in the general population, even those with underlying health conditions or those who have experienced allergic reactions in the past, is it safe to get the vaccine? <clears throat> yes. Next question. Um, yeah, and as I've said before, this vaccine is safer than water. Uh, we have now, in the United States, administered over 100 million doses. And so if you remember the studies that were done on the vaccines, they had like 40,000 people in the tests. You know, 100 million people is hundreds of times more than that. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, we have not heard of any significant adverse outcomes from these vaccines. Um, and if you can't find something after 100 million doses, if it happens, it is something incredibly rare. Um, so yes, we do know that most people are going to feel their immune system turn on, and that's going to make them feel achy and tired and weak and um, maybe a little nauseated. Um, and we know that about one out of 100,000 people might have an anaphylactic reaction. Um, and again, we know how to cope with those. Um, they're, although frightening, if you don't have the right equipment, we have the right equipment. So we know how to take care of that. So yes, they are very safe. Um, and again, at this point, we have vaccinated mostly people who are elderly and people who are what I would call medically frail. And those people have done fine. We've also vaccinated a lot of healthcare workers who tend to be young and vigorous. And those people have all done fine. So right now we have yet to discover any worrisome adverse event or outcome from using this vaccine. As we talk about the young and vigorous, what would you say if someone says, well, people in my age group are doing fine with COVID. Why would I wanna take the risk of getting the vaccine? Yeah, well, outside of pregnancy, which is what you mentioned, um, I think that's, that's a, that is a rational argument. Um, I think if you want to wait and um, make sure that you're comfortable, I'm, I'm okay with that. As long as you are not in a position where you might spread the virus to somebody who you could damage. Uh, so if you have grandparents, uh, if you work in a nursing home, um, you know, then I think you wouldn't be able to visit uh, with, you know, with, with your grandparents or something else. Um, but if you are really just young and single and living independently and uh, you're not exposed to the public in any meaningful way, I, I think it's not unreasonable to wait. Um, however, I, I don't know many people like that. So That's a good question. So let's dive into those at-risk groups, particularly considering the new advice you shared that pregnant women are now advised to vaccinate. Yeah. Is it true that none of the vaccines were studied in pregnant women? And if so, how do we know that it's safe for them to receive the vaccine? Yeah, and so that was that's actually one group which I don't think Joellen mentioned. So as of today, oh, all pregnant women over the age of 16 are eligible for vaccination. <clears throat> and what I will state is that all of the professional obstetrical groups who, whose sole occupation is worrying about keeping pregnant mommies safe, they are all recommending the vaccination. So the CDC and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and um, the midwives, everybody is recommending this for pregnant women. Now, why would that be the case since most pregnant women are between the ages, say, of uh, 18 and 38, uh, and that population tends to tolerate the, the virus pretty well. And the answer is that pregnancy is a risk factor for a bad outcome. So um, if you develop, well, they did a study, and actually the study was done in Washington State, <clears throat> and they compared women aged, I think it was 20 to 39, who were pregnant and got COVID to women who were between 20 and 39 who were not pregnant and got COVID. And four times as many people ended, who were pregnant ended up in the hospital. 
So pregnancy made it four times more likely that you would need to be hospitalized for the COVID. Now, <clears throat> the total, the absolute numbers are very small. So let's say it's um, one out of 120 to 29 year olds who get COVID end up in the hospital. Well, with pregnancy, then it would be four out of 100 people. And so that's still a very small number. But the point is pregnancy does change the immune system in some way, which makes an infection with COVID more dangerous. Also the risk of mortality, that is the risk of dying is higher in a pregnant woman. And because we have no evidence of any bad outcomes or dangerous um, consequences of vaccinating a pregnant person, we recommend that they get vaccinated because there's big risks if you get COVID and no apparent risks if you don't. But Kristen, you asked the right question, which is, well, how do you know that, Dr. Butler? Was this, they, they weren't included in these studies, right? And the first thing I want to say is, why aren't we just all incredibly irritated at the fact that pregnant women were excluded from these studies? It's like pregnancy is not some weird things that humans barely ever run into, right? It's a totally normal part of being a woman. And anyway, so I'm irritated that they were not included in those studies. And I think most people should be irritated by that. And I know why they didn't include them. It was for legal reasons and other stuff, but they got to get over that. Um, so how, why am I so confident? And again, it goes back to that 100 million doses given. <clears throat> you imagine that most of the healthcare workers in this country are women. And of all of the healthcare workers who were vaccinated in this country, some of them must have been pregnant and not aware of it, or must have been pregnant and didn't tell anybody. Being pregnant, as far as I'm aware, was not uh, on, the, on the questionnaire. So if 100 million people have been vaccinated in this country, surely at least, I don't know what, 1% of those people were vaccinated. Actually, let me back up. 100 million doses have been given. That's 50 million people who've been vaccinated. So I apologize, 50 million people. But still, 1% of that is 50,000 people. Even, and what I'm saying is even if only 1% of those people we vaccinated so far were pregnant, that's still more women than were in any of the studies that were done because there's only 30 or 40,000 people in those studies. So what I'm saying is we now have track record, right? We now um, know that there haven't been all these reports of bad things that happen to pregnant women if they get the shot. Uh, we also know that these vaccines were tested in animal models, and so in rats and beagles and other things, and none of them had any problems with pregnancy either. Now, most people will say, well, dang it, doc, I'm not a rat, and I know, but many of the medications we use uh, in medicine for people have never been studied in pregnant women. They've only ever been studied in an animal models, and we still recommend them at times. So um, it's mostly the track record that uh, we've seen no adverse outcomes to vaccinations in pregnant women. It's been years since I was pregnant, but I remember being very concerned about pregnant women having high fevers. As we look toward the vaccine side effects, do we have any concerns about the fevers being dangerous uh, for the babies? Yeah. So yeah, I think that's an excellent question and I'm sure a, a lot of women are concerned about that. <clears throat> There's a, a rule of medicine that you learn in, in medical school. And that is the best way to keep a baby safe is to keep, keep the baby's life support system safe. And that's the mommy. <laughs> so the best way to keep a baby safe is to keep the mommy safe. Um, and yeah, there is no evidence that routine normal fevers are dangerous in pregnancy. There are some very rare types of fevers that can happen where somebody might have very, very high fevers for a long period of time that we cannot control. And those could potentially be dangerous, but I've never seen that in my career. And so the type of fevers that you might get after the um, COVID-19 vaccine are totally safe during pregnancy. And most people are seeing fevers you know, up to 101. I've heard of a couple of cases, maybe like 102, 103. And, and the pregnant female body is absolutely designed to keep their baby safe from that type of a fever. 
Related to uh, side effects, we have a question coming in about symptoms from the vaccine. We're being told that, you know, we might expect to feel nauseous or have chills or a fever. If people aren't experiencing those symptoms, is the vaccine still at work in their body? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I had a terrible time after my vaccine and I'm taking it to mean that I got a really good response. Um, the answer is we don't know yet. Um, I have not read anything to suggest that what you are saying is true. Uh, but I also have not seen any studies that have compared the people who have a, a bumpy road after the vaccine to those who don't. So I, I can't answer that question, I'm sorry. Let's talk a little bit um, about children. Um, we saw the Wenatchee School District recently released a proposal and a survey to parents and staff um, proposing to significantly decrease COVID safety measures and return to school full time. Can you talk about the health district's recommendations when it comes to the return to in-person learning for our local students? Yeah, well, I, I will take issue with the words you use there. You said significantly reduce the measures. The only measure that I've heard that's in discussion for reducing is the six foot distancing because it's impossible to uh, get all the kids back into a classroom or onto a school bus and keep the desks spread apart by six feet. Um, but all masking and hygiene and enhanced ventilation and hand washing and everything else uh, is still gonna be in place. According to the communications they sent out to parents, uh, they were saying that they would no longer be able to do temperature checks, mm -hmm. uh, hand washing stations, sanitization, cleaning the desks, um, uh, that sort of thing. And then clearly there'd be masks off during, um, during lunchtime. So there would be a period of time where the students were in close proximity and unmasked. Yeah, so that, that's, I think those are fair. And this is a bit of a long answer, but bear with me. <clears throat> so we did meet specifically with Dr. Gordon and the Wenatchee schools. We also met with the um, uh, person at the Washington State Department of Health whose entire career is built around uh, infectious disease safety in schools. Um, and so our, our biggest concerns during that conversation were about mealtimes. And I think you're right, it's a difficult time because it's when we take the masks down and we tend to sit close to each other and chat and share our, our milk or whatever. Um, and, and so what I can say is the Wenatchee schools had a very clear plan on what they were gonna do with that. They called it their grab and go lunches. Um, and they, I believe were, you know, it's their essentially sack lunches that are gonna be picked up and they're gonna eat them outside, spread apart and all that kind of stuff. So they have a plan for how they're, uh, they're gonna address that. And as far as I could, you know, during the conversation, it sounded like a good plan to me. Um, it sounded at least as safe as what most of us are doing in the workplace now who have been back on site forever. But you're right, that is an at-risk situation. And I think if the, um, students are not taking some degree of responsibility to keep themselves safe. And if they're not being policed in some way to make sure that they're keeping themselves safe, that could be an area of transmission. The issue of hygiene to the desktop is a little bit different and a little bit controversial. And the uh, lady from the Department of Health was actually pointing out that there's no great evidence in support of that and she was actually worried that we're causing more asthma because of people having bad reactions to the chemicals that are off-gassing from the desk after you've cleaned it, um, that it's actually inhaling those fumes is more dangerous than the chance of contracting something from a desktop. Now, what she also said was she's been saying this for years and nobody has done anything about it yet. So I think that is an area of controversy at the Department of Health. Um, and so, you know, again, there are many sides to this to think about. What I would say is what we know now that we did not know a year ago, that we did not know as well nine months ago, um, is that this is an airborne illness. And um, what that means is most, say 80% of transmission happens through the air. And so masking is going to catch 80%. If you imagine having somebody in a classroom who is unmasked 
and they are coughing or they're yelling and larger droplets are escaping their mouth and landing on their desk. And then in some way they're wiping that with their, or the person on the next, next desk over wipes their hand across that desk and then touches their eyeball, then you could imagine a risk of transmission. But again, it's not easy to do transmission that way. Um, so it's, you know, the, the, the recommendation for the desktop hygiene came out of our work with influenza. Um, and I cannot tell you exactly how important it is, but I'm absolutely sure it's not as important as what's in the air. So I've told people I'm actually more concerned about having, say, 30 people in a classroom all breathing the same air than I am about having desks three feet apart. Because I think the masks are going to stop droplets spreading. The three foot rule is really about not having a mask on and projecting droplets three feet. And as long as everybody is masked, that's kind of not an issue. But having more lungs breathing in a small space could be an issue. And the response to that is we enhance the ventilation. And there's a lot of science behind this, but it's basically how many times the entire volume of air in the classroom is sucked out and replaced by fresh air. Um, and they know what that needs to be and what the standards need to be and uh, where possible opening windows, opening doors and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, the real message, that my message is we don't know. We just don't know yet what it takes to keep people safe. We've kept people safe, but are we doing 10 times more than we need to to keep people safe? Or are we only doing 10% more than we need to? If it's only 10% and we put people three feet apart in a classroom, we're gonna see transmission. And as soon as we see that, we have to stop and go back to what we were doing because we found the limit. But if we put people in classrooms and they're three feet apart and no transmission happens, well, then we know we can get more kids back into class. And if the only thing in, at play here was COVID transmission, I would say keep everybody at home, but that's not the only thing at play, obviously. Getting kids back into class is super important. So I feel confident now having worked with our school districts that they will take the appropriate precautions to keep their students safe and their staff safe and they will do anything they do in a thoughtful manner. Um, however, uh, I have had this discussion with the Washington State Department of Health and they are very clear that they do not recommend um, breaking that three foot rule and putting more than that number of um, kids in a classroom. And so I am gonna um, uphold what the Washington State Department of Health is recommending um, because I don't have any stronger evidence than they have in the opposite direction. I just have some suspicions. Can you update us a bit on vaccine development and testing for children? Mm. Um, yeah, so my understanding is those tests are currently ongoing. Um, and I think I heard it was like down to age six that they're currently ongoing. Um, I anticipate that we'll have those studies out um, by the end of 2021. Um, and so hopefully starting in 2022, we can start vaccinating kids also. Um, kids do represent this interesting problem um, of really tolerating the disease very well. And so the problem with kids getting the disease is that they can spread it to adults. Um, so uh, it's appropriate that, there, um, that th this research has been delayed until we make sure that it is safe in adults. It's also ironic if you look at the history of vaccinations, um, all childhood illnesses, things like polio, which paralyzes kids and measles uh, or mumps, which can make kids infertile when they grow up, those were wiped out really fast because parents absolutely insisted that their kids were vaccinated. So as parents, we're much more concerned about the safety and health of our child than our own. Um, and this disease, COVID, is not a childhood disease. It's an adult disease. And so we're just seeing a very different pattern of concern. Talk a little bit about the virus itself. We're seeing uh, reports of a very small number of people who become seriously ill from the virus, both children and adults. How prevalent is the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children and the COVID kind of long haulers? And who's at risk for developing those severe side effects? 
Yeah. So the first one, what you, we call MISC, um, is this very, very rare um, condition that has been described in children. These kids tend to do okay with COVID and then two or three weeks later come down with a really funky rash and they feel pretty bad and then their um, immune system goes a little bit bonkers and starts attacking their organs. Um, and most of them end up in hospital and a few of them die. Um, my understanding today is that we have had two cases of that throughout the pandemic in Chelan and Douglas counties. And if memory serves, we've had somewhere between like 7,000 or 9,000 positive cases in kids. So you can do the math on that. You know, it's like one out of 3,500, one out of 4,000 cases in our community has ended up with that. Um, I did read in the paper the other day about another uh, case in Grant County uh, a couple of weeks ago. So incredibly rare. Um, and yeah, worrisome and we don't really understand it. Now for non-children, for adults, um, there is a, a spectrum of disease. In general, elderly and what I call medically frail people uh, have a much harder time. Um, and we don't quite understand all of the whys, but we have seen patterns. Um, people who are, say, over the age of 80 tend not to do well. Um, people with multiple chronic medical problems, especially things like diabetes and obesity, um, tend to get more sick. Um, <clears throat> and you can't predict it. Um, it just happens. And I think that's what makes it so difficult uh, to manage this disease. Um, the local mortality rate, I don't have at my fingertips. I think um, as I was reviewing those pregnancy studies, I think it was like 0.7%. So less than 1%. And most people would say, gosh, that's no big deal. What we, what's all the fuss about? And what all the fuss is about is that more people back a few weeks ago, more people were dying every single day than died in 9-11. And this country has made a huge big deal about 9-11. And we were having one nine, we were having seven 9-11s every week. We've lost more people than were lost in essentially all of the wars that have been fought in the last century. Um, so, you know, it's just, again, you, you can make the argument in either direction. I think until a family has lost somebody, you don't have the same perspective as somebody who has lost a friend or, or a family member. But losing 500 um, million people in this country um, in the course of a year is the worst disaster we have ever suffered. And maybe you don't think it's a big deal, but most of us think that's a pretty big deal. Agreed. We're, we're seeing that some states are lifting their public masking, masking requirements. From a public health perspective, what are your thoughts on these recommendations? Yeah. Um, I think it's ridiculous. I'm embarrassed for those states. Um, again, we know the impact of masking now. And everybody will say, yeah, but you've changed your mind so many times. No, I changed my mind once. <laughs> I've stuck with it for the last nine months. Um, and that's the nature of science. We learn things, right? And we have to adapt. And that's how we keep people alive. Um, but yeah, masking is really the only important thing in my mind. Um, and that's where we really have to focus our attention. Uh, it's a bummer. I really dislike wearing my mask. No question about it. Um, I wear my seatbelt, uh, I wash my hands before I cook food for other people, um, and I wear my mask to keep other people safe. So, you know, it's just one, th it's one more thing that we do when we live in a community um, to keep each other safe. We're seeing that um, our own region here is moving to phase three starting on March 22nd. And for some sectors, it sounds like youth sports starting tomorrow. Can you tell us what this means for us as a community? Is it safe to eat out? Is it safe to travel for spring break? What else, what, what questions are you seeing pop up? Yeah, so the, um, the phases that start today are the vaccine phases and the opening of the economy, I believe starts next Monday, right? Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate how much the business community has suffered during the pandemic. 
And I appreciate that we have to get the economy open. Um, and I am still going to stay home unless I absolutely need to go out. Um, and that's obviously I've been impacted by this uh, pandemic, maybe more than other people have. Um, I think it's getting warm and I'm going to wait to eat outdoors. Um, but again, yeah, the economies are opening and I think we have to do that for economic reasons. From a public health standpoint, uh, I'm still going to stay home. <laughs> I did notice that the, um, that the phase restrictions in phase three still say that dancing is prohibited. So I think we're just all living our, um, our own internal uh, dirty dancing scene here. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to remember what normal life was like. While um, most changes have been isolating and hard, talking about masking and staying at home, those are really difficult. I wonder what um, we may keep, um, such as, do we think that handshakes are going to make a comeback? <laughs> are we gonna decide that's probably not a, a great plan moving forward? You know, we are, we are limbic creatures. And what do I mean by that? We are driven by our midbrains <clears throat> and we are mammals first and foremost. Mammals have to make eye contact with each other. We do not do well if, if we don't make eye contact. If you've ever watched a, a newborn mother and, I'm sorry, a newborn baby and mother, they're just locked on, right? Eye to eye the whole time. We have to touch. We have to snuggle. We have to hug. That's who we are. Um, we can't avoid that. Um, and every single time I walk into a crowd of people, everybody sticks their hand out. I do too. <laughs> so yes, we're, we're still going to be touching each other. That's how we, that's, that's who we are. What would you say to people who are asking about um, whether or not they should vaccinate if they feel that they've had COVID? Do they have enough antibodies that they're that they no longer have a need to vaccinate? Yeah, so that's been studied pretty thoroughly by now. And the answer is it's impossible to know how much protection you have. And I have an incredibly smart friend who's actually a, a professor of mathematics at Berkeley. And we got into a big Facebook argument about this. And he said, well, just test everybody's antibodies and then you'll know. And, and what I have to explain to people is that your immune system is like an orchestra. It's got a bunch of different players and they each have to play their part precisely. And, you know, there's multiple different types of antibodies. So maybe one is like the bassoon and the other is like the violin and the other is like the piano. Um, but what all we can tell is that you have a piano present in your bloodstream. You've got that particular antibody present, but we don't know how loud that piano normally plays in this orchestra. Maybe that piano doesn't do anything in this orchestra. Um, and so we don't know how that particular antibody works against the virus. So yes, we can identify that you've got a bassoon or a piano, you've got those antibodies, but we don't know if that means that your orchestra can still make music. We don't know if that means your immune system can still fight the virus. So just checking antibodies doesn't help us. We are aware that many people now have contracted COVID for the second time. Uh, in fact, the recommendation is if somebody's exposed uh, to somebody with COVID and it's been more than three months since their personal case of COVID, they should be tested and quarantined. So we know that wild type Im immunity lasts for sure about three months, but we don't know much longer than that. And because of that, we need to vaccinate people. Now, you should ask, well, how do we know that the vaccine lasts longer than three months? And we don't. Well, that's not quite fair. The studies were done nine months ago now. And so we know that it's lasted for nine months in those people. It's just this pandemic has been so short, we can't really say. Um, but we are hopeful that, and it appears that, the um, vaccine is giving a much more, what I would call robust, uh, immunity uh, protection. So um, your, your orchestra is going to play more effectively and louder if you get the vaccine 
than it might have done if you got an infection, what we call wild type uh, COVID. So yes, we do recommend vaccination, no downside to vaccination, no evidence that if you get vaccinated after you've had COVID that you'll have um, a bumpier road after the vaccine. Those things could be true, but again, there's no evidence right now of that. You talked about the, the possibility of an impending fourth wave. Um, can you share some information on the South African, UK, and Brazilian variant, variants that we're seeing? You said you assume that perhaps they're in our community. Yeah, How effective are the vaccines against the variants? Yeah. So, you know, in, in human speak, we like to, there are words that we like to use and things like UK and Brazilian and South African. So the Wuhan virus is the one that we have now. It's it's the what you might think of original variant. Um, they all have numbers which are hard to remember, so I'm just going to use those names. So the UK variant um, came out of the UK, surprise, uh, and is now the predominant strain in Great Britain and in many parts of Europe. And what we have seen is that the uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines seem to offer good protection against those variants, um, that B117 or the UK variant. The um, Brazilian variant, not quite so good, and the South African variant, uh, I think it's adequate, but also not great. So the UK variant, which in our state now is the most prevalent variant, the immunization seemed to work well against that. And you know, it's, is it 50% effective? Is it 80% effective? Those numbers seem to make sense on paper, but when you're actually studying humans who are mobile and all over the place and being exposed in different ways and using different types of PPE, it's, it's pretty hard. So what we can say with confidence is that they offer protection, but I can't tell you if that's 90% as good or 50% as good you know, as against the Wuhan variant. But this is why I suspect that we are all gonna need COVID booster shots annually or every couple of years and those boosters will be targeted at the variants that have, you know, that are causing problems for us. The difficult thing right now, the B117 um, new study that I saw this week or last week, uh, looks like it is causing worse disease um, and leading to more hospitalizations. About a month ago, when we first learned about it, that was not the case. There was no evidence that that was true. But now it does appear that the B117 or the UK variant is actually a more aggressive uh, virus. Um, I don't have that same kind of information on the South African or the Brazilian variant. Um, for sure, all three variants are in Washington state. And what we know out of Europe is that once the uh, UK variant landed, it seemed to have um, an affinity for kids. So kids started getting uh, more infections and sicker with the uh, UK variant than they had been before it arrived. And in fact, in Europe, there were some countries that had all their schools open and they had to shut them down. So um, I'm aware of that, I'm sensitized to that. And what I know is, as we mentioned earlier, that um, we are seeing an uptick in the last week of positive cases and many of those are in kids. And so that's why I'm concerned that this may be the B117 in our community. Um, because it's affecting kids, and kids previously had not been quite as affected. All of this could go away tomorrow. The, the numbers may look better next week, and I'll say, never mind, it was just a blip. But just, you know, looking at the numbers as, as I do, um, I'm a little worried about that. Um, Are we testing for the variant in our community? Do we have knowledge of its right. uh, prevalence? The, uh, as of last week, um, I, was, I had not heard of any variants in Chelan or Douglas counties. <clears throat> so remember, um, how we check for a variant is a very random act. Um, a certain number of tests are sent to a special laboratory and they're sequenced looking for the um, genetic you know, variation that makes them a variant. It's not every test. It's not 10% of tests. It's not one test from each county in the state. It's totally random. So I make the analogy to, you know, if, if you have a, um, a, a camera in the woods, um, a wildlife camera or a game camera, and you capture a cougar, you know, on that camera, and you go out and pick up your camera and bring it home and say, holy smokes, I found a cougar. 
well, yeah, you know there was a cougar in the woods at that time. What you don't know is, was there one? Were there 20? Is it still in that area? Is it somewhere else? So the surveillance we're doing right now doesn't help us answer any of those questions. We either know it's in the state or we don't. We know it's in the county or we don't, but we don't know when it got here and we don't know how prevalent it is. Uh, so I'm assuming it's here. And I think the safest thing is for all of us to assume it's here and be very, very careful. That's interesting. I hadn't realized that. With all the masking we are doing, I'm surprised at how often we're hearing about individuals experiencing viral infections, having colds. If people do come down with the sniffles or the snor sore throat, are health experts recommending that they stay home, get a test to confirm they have COVID or carry on? Yeah, we have seen very little viral infection. Uh, we've seen some diarrhea type of illnesses. We have not seen hardly any coughs and colds. Um, and because we are not seeing um, upper respiratory tract infections, we call them, we're not seeing snotty noses and congestion, we're not seeing ear infections, and we're not seeing sinusitis. Now, yes, they happen, but hardly at all. So I would say if anybody has symptoms that really feel like they've got a cold, that is, they've got fever, they've got headache, they've got sore throat, absolutely get tested. Um, stay home and then get tested. Um, but what we are seeing right now is we're in allergy season, right? And so there's a lot of people with sore throat and runny nose because the grass is turning greener and the buds are coming out on the trees. And if you know that you have never in your life felt this kind of a sore throat and had this kind of a headache, you bet, stay home, get tested. We got oodles of testing right now like we didn't have before. Just come on in, we're happy to test you. But if you know that every single year in March, you get a scratchy throat and a headache, it's probably that. Unless you know that you have been exposed or you've been taking some uh, risks by spending time with friends and not wearing your mask, that kind of thing. So the safest thing is always get tested. We've got loads of tests, just come on in, we're happy to do that. Um, but if you know, gosh, this is the same old thing I always get, then no, you don't need to come in and get tested. I see that we're nearing the end of our hour. I would love to invite you both to share your closing thoughts regarding the vaccine or the virus or um, upcoming tiers um, and availability or regarding the county's phase three reopening. Joellen, how about we start with you? Great, thank you. Um, just wanna remind people that the um, eligibility phase is expanded again today. So we will see a high level of interest in the vaccine Please know that uh, there is good supply chain uh, coming our way to Washington State. And if you can't get in for your appointment and you're eligible, um, just keep trying because we know we're going to work through people as fast as we can. I was down at the Town Toyota Center today. There is a very large crew ready to put shots in arms um, and move people through. Same here at Confluence Health, as well as our other regional healthcare partners. We wanna vaccinate people as quickly as we can. I wanna reiterate what um, Dr. Butler said. Um, the, the best shot for you may be the shot that's available at the time. So if you're comfortable taking uh, Pfizer or Moderna that we have in community, that's great. I know some of our pharmacies may have Johnson & Johnson, but um, just uh, make, make sure that you do uh, get your questions answered and uh, hopefully vaccination is the right choice for you. Yeah, um, I agree with all of that. I would say that um, all of us in primary care are reaching out to our high risk patients and inviting them to come in. Um, remind people, if you're not quite sure what all this means, you can go to um, findmyphasewa.org, which is phase finder, um, and run through the questions as Joellen was saying, and it'll tell you if you're in phase or not. Um, and then, yeah, it's... Um, I think we're all blessed to live in interesting times. And um, this thing keeps changing and keeps rolling. And I think uh, we keep learning a lot about it. So I appreciate everybody's patience. Um, I appreciate all the questions that people have. Um, I appreciate people listening uh, to, again, folks who have spent their entire careers thinking about these problems um, and issues like this. Um, and, and fact checking what you hear. Um, if you hear something and are made of, aware of something that nobody else is aware of, and you're the only one with the inside dirt, 
it's probably dirt. <laughs> it's, it's probably not true. Um, and so make sure you fact check those things. Uh, please call the Chelan Douglas Health District. Um, please, uh, when you're speaking with your healthcare provider, ask them if these things that they have heard that you have heard are true. Uh, all of us are in this to keep people healthy. That's our only um, objective in this. And we wanna keep you healthy too. Thank you both. I, I recognize that this virus as you've both um, expressed and its effects have been polarizing for our community and especially difficult for our local businesses and our economy. And as you said, to the ever-changing and updating information as we learn more about the virus and the vaccine and restrictions, I really want to thank our panelists, Dr. Butler and Joellen, for the opportunity for us as a community to learn about the COVID vaccine and the hope that it offers in shielding our community from the effects of the virus. And to our participants, I want to thank you for your constructive and productive questions. I'd like to invite you to join us at the museum. All galleries at the Wenatchee Valley Museum are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4 at 25% capacity. We also have engaging events coming up online and in person, and we look forward to inviting Dr. Butler and Joellen back again in two weeks on March 31st from 2 to 3 p.m. for the continuation of the vaccine and COVID conversation series. Learn more and join us at WenatcheeValleyMuseum.org. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in person again soon. <laughs>